I'm General Mike Myatt and President and CEO of the Marines Memorial Association. And we're presenting tonight in partnership with the Commonwealth Club of California. Emma Skye is an Oxford graduate who in 2003 opposed the Iraq War, volunteered to help rebuild Iraq after the overthrow of Saddam Hussein. She had little idea what she was going to get herself into. Multiple tours that would last nearly a decade, longer than any senior military officer or political official. She was highly valued for her controversial voice and outsider's point of view. During the most painful stages of the war, she was one of the few policy advisors to develop friendships and relationships with senior leaders. Please help me welcome Emma Sky. So thank you for that very kind introduction. And it's a wonderful treat to be here in San Francisco. It's my first time ever. And I had a lovely tour today with a fighter pilot. So got to see a bit of the town. And it's really beautiful. And I'm very happy to be here. So thank you very much for inviting me. When I left Iraq in September 2010, I didn't know what I was going to do next. And I was angry. And I struggled to make sense of what the war had been for. All that loss, all that blood and treasure, for what? And I kept going back to Iraq. I couldn't stay away. So every few months, I'd just go back and visit my friends in Iraq. And I thought, you know, I've seen so much of what happened during the war that I felt I had a duty to write about it. And I thought that we honored the lives that were lost by trying to learn the right lessons. And I wanted to acknowledge the huge effort that had gone in to trying to give the Iraqi people hope for a better future. No matter all the mistakes, we tried very hard. And I wanted to pay tribute to Iraq, because it's a country I came very much to love. So that's why I sat down and wrote this book. So let me start where the book starts, which was back in 2003, when the British government sent out an email asking for volunteers to go and run the country for three months before we handed it back to the Iraqis. Three months, they said. So I was somebody who was against the war. And when I say I was against the war, it's not just to say, oh, I was against the war. I was really against the war. I was against the first Gulf War. I'd signed up to be a human shield, in fact, during the first Gulf War. And I'd spent the 10 years between first and second Gulf War um, living in Jerusalem, working in support of the peace process, helping manage projects to build up the capacity of the Palestinian Authority, and helping build relations between Israelis and Palestinians. So I was against the war in 2003, but I thought, here's my opportunity to go out to Iraq to apologize to Iraqis for the war and to help them rebuild their country because I got some skills which I've developed. Now, before I went out in 2003, I didn't receive a briefing. In fact, I had one phone call from somebody in the British government. I was living up in the north of England in Manchester. So I received one phone call. And this phone call said, oh, you know, you've been to the Middle East. Don't worry. Um, find your way to RAF Bryce Norton, the Royal Air Force Base Bryce Norton. Get on a plane to Basra. 
And when you arrive, you'll be met by somebody holding a sign with your name on it and taken to the nearest hotel. Well, it sounded plausible. It was June 2003. The invasion had been three months previous. The war was apparently over. I assume the British government knew what it was doing. It just hadn't told me. So, I followed the instructions that I'd received. I found RAF Bryce Norton on the map, got there, found there was a military plane full of British soldiers on their way to Basra. I got a ride with them, and I arrived in Basra. Now that's when things started to break down a bit, because it was very apparent that nobody was expecting me. There was no sign with my name on it, and nobody had a clue what I was doing arriving with the military into Basra. So I spent my first night in Iraq sleeping in the airport, in the corridor from hell. It was 150 degrees, there was no air conditioning, and all the British soldiers had just stripped down to their underwear and were lying on their nice mats. Now, I didn't have a nice mat because I thought I was going to be staying in a hotel. And I hadn't really thought about what underwear to wear. So my underwear wasn't exactly appropriate to be stripping down into. So the next day, I thought, I'm, I can't stay in Basra. I found a C-130 going up to Baghdad. So I jumped on that, got to Baghdad, and found my way to the Republican Palace which was the headquarters of the Coalition Provisional Authority. So walked into the palace and said, you know, hello, I'm Emma from England, come to volunteer. <laughs> and they had a list, and my name was on that list. So that was comforting. I thought, at least somebody's expecting me. And I received my first briefing. It was from a British colonel. And he told me the situation in Iraq is stable, it's fine, the war's over. The only thing you've got to watch out for is trigger happy Americans. So that was less reassuring. And I was told they had enough people in Baghdad, so after a week they said, you know, go and try the north. So I found a flight to Mosul, got to Mosul, and there was somebody then said, oh no, we're all right, we've got people here, keep going. So I kept going, and after a couple more weeks, I arrived in Kirkuk. And it was in Kirkuk that I was told that I was now the senior civilian responsible for governing the province and reporting directly to Ambassador Bremer. Now, how embarrassing. I'm not from that heritage of Brits who used to go and run the colonies. It's not my background. I had no experience of running a town in Britain, let alone a province in somebody else's country. But I realized that Iraqis took my new role seriously when insurgents tried to assassinate me during my first week in Kirkuk. So they approached my house in the middle of the night with rockets, and they fired five rockets into the house. Now, fortunately, it was a well-made house, and the rocket, one of the rockets came up through the ceiling into the room where I was in bed. An explosion was taken out within the ceiling. That was my first week, and later that day, after I'd accounted for everybody, fortunately, there was nobody killed. I had Gurkha security guards, and one or two were injured. But I went later that day, to the Kirkuk government building, which was supposedly the headquarters of the provincial Iraqi government. So I walked in, and it was swarming with US soldiers. They'd taken over every room in the building, and they put their unit sign on it. And I'd never really had any interaction with the military before, let alone the US military. And so I grabbed a soldier and said, you know, take me to your boss or chief or whatever you call him. <laughs> and this guy was like, yes, ma'am, follow me. 
So I followed him up the stairs to this very, very large room that had previously been the governor of Kirkuk's office. And I walked in, and there was Colonel Mabel lying on the couch with his feet up. And I introduced myself, and I said, you know, I said, Colonel, it's all rather awkward and embarrassing, but my house has been blown up, and I just wondered if you might have a tent on the airfield that I could stay in. Now, Colonel Mabel sat up, snarled, poked his finger in the air, and said, you know, we're going to hunt them down. And I said, Colonel, you ought to do no such thing. They're attacking me because I'm a symbol of an illegal occupation. All I ask from you is a tent, not a death warrant for my attackers. So I left his office furious. It was everything that I imagined the US military to be. But I soon received information that a tent had been made available to me on the airfield. What I didn't realize until I turned up there that night was it already had seven men in it. So that was my new accommodation. So I returned the next day to the government building to see Colonel Mavel again. And I brought with me my laptop. I had downloaded onto it the Fourth Geneva Convention. And I pulled up a chair next to Colonel Mavel. He was sitting by his desk at this stage. And I read it to him line by line. And I said, Colonel Mavel, if I find you violating any of the articles of the Fourth Geneva Convention, I will take you to The Hague. And this was early days, and I didn't realize at that stage that America is not a signatory to the International Criminal Court, <laughs> and you can't take Americans to The Hague. <laughs> Mavel, much to my great surprise, treated my arrival in Kirkuk with enthusiasm as he viewed me as his replacement, the first of the civilians to replace the military. He and his paratroopers had jumped into Iraq three months before. They were tired and they wanted to go home. So Mavel announced that we would share an office in the government building, that he would take me around the province, introduce me to everybody before he departed. And I thought, it's only going to be a couple of weeks. I can put up with him for that long. And each morning, he would bring me tea. I felt I was being treated like some exotic pet. <laughs> He'd obviously read somewhere that British women drink tea, so each morning he would make me a cup of tea. And that's how the day started. And it became quite an unlikely partnership. Because the more we got to talk to each other, because we were forced to sit in the same office, going out to all these meetings together, the more we came to realize that we actually had the same goal, which was to get Kirkuk back on its feet, with Iraqis running their own affairs so that US military could leave. And the more I got to know Mavel, the more I realized that we had shared values. We'd read the same books, and he had a wicked sense of humor. And Mavel wanted to learn from me everything that I knew about the Middle East. And it soon became clear that lots of civilians were not going to arrive any time soon. I was it. And the brigade was going to stay a lot longer. So I used to spend my days meeting different groups of Iraqis, listening to their fears and grievances, and mediating between them. So let me tell you a little bit about Kirkuk. It's a multi-ethnic, multicultural place. It's home to Arabs, Kurds, Turkmen, Sunni, Shia, Sufi, Christian, Kakai, Shabak, Yazidi. And it has oil. And the Ba'ath Party had Arabized the province by expelling Kurds and importing Arabs from the south. And then the aftermath of the overthrow of the Saddam regime, there was a struggle for control of the province, with Kurds trying to annex it to Kurdistan. But I was struck by how the different communities intermarried. They spoke each other's languages. 
and they loved each other's cultures. So in an attempt to diffuse tensions, I organized a cultural event at the Kukuk Museum. And for one evening, many of the artifacts that had been looted and were being kept in people's homes were returned to the museum and put on display. And groups put on their traditional performances. And the night culminated with everyone spontaneously coming forward, hand in hand, to dance the dabka in a long line. And one of the Iraqi politicians jumped up and he said, this is Kirk Cook. This is who we are. And it's a night I will always remember. We were successful on the ground in Kirk Cook, empowering local leaders, and mediating between and balancing the competing groups. But decisions have been taken way above our heads at the national level, which had dramatic impact on the country. So a month before I'd arrived in Iraq, the coalition dissolved the Ba'ath Party and dismissed the security institutions. And in so doing, it removed the sinews of the state that held the country together. And then the resulting power vacuum, Iraqis formed gangs to protect themselves. Insurgents and militias flourished. And it led to a breakdown in social order and Iraq's descent into civil war. So in my first week in Baghdad, when I'd first arrived, I'd gone downtown to just have a look at the place. And I was really struck by all the looting. And I stood in front of this house, which had obviously at one stage been this you know, very, very wealthy house. It was a beautiful building. And it had just been totally looted. And I stood there staring at it when an Iraqi man walked past me and turned to me and he said in Arabic, Ahalam Hobsi. This is a Hobbesian world. And I looked at him perplexed. And he repeated himself, Hobbes, Hobbes. Obviously wondering who was this foreigner and why doesn't she know about Hobbes? And I was left wondering, you know, who is this Iraqi man and how does he know about Hobbes? And it was Hobbes who had written that in the absence of the state and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, So wind forward to 2006. I had just returned to the UK after a tour of Afghanistan when I received an email out of the blue from General Odierno asking me to return to Iraq with him as his political advisor. Now, I had met General Odierno during my time in Kirkuk as he'd been Colonel Mavel's boss and he'd just been appointed to be the US commander of the Corps in Iraq for the search. Now, I did what any sensible person would have done on receiving such an email. I pretended it had gone to my spam and ignored it. <laughs> but, as you know, generals have minions and they have lots and lots of these minions. And within a few hours, a picture of my house on Google Earth, this picture of my house in London, Google Earth appeared with rockets pointing down at it. I thought, oh, not again. So I went back to Iraq in 2007. And General Odierno told me that he wanted me to accompany him wherever he went. And he said, you know, you've got a very different perspective. And I want to understand how you see things. And he said, I want you to tell me when I'm screwing up. And that's pretty amazing guidance to be given. Because all the books on leadership will always tell you to hire people who are different from yourself. And people rarely do. They tend to hire people who are like them. Well, if any of you have seen General Odierno, to start with, he's like this genetically modified human being who is massive. He and I are very, very different. We have never read any of the same books. 
We don't go and watch the same sports. We don't drink the same drinks. In fact, our lives would never have connected in any way whatsoever if it hadn't been for the Iraq war. And to be told by a guy like him, you must tell me when I'm screwing up, I just thought this is the most perfect job for me. <laughs> so at that stage, the levels of violence in Iraq were just simply horrific. And everyone thought the country was lost. And my main focus during this period was trying to understand what was driving instability in Iraq. Who were all these different armed groups? Why were they using violence? And how to get them to come out of the fight? Now, the military was used to identifying and targeting the enemy. So it required a real change in mindset to try to understand who these armed groups were and what they wanted, particularly difficult when they were killing our soldiers. And the Iraqi government was hugely suspicious that the US military was doing deals with armed groups which wanted to overthrow the Iraqi government. Now I found an unexpected ally in my endeavors. Her name was Dr. Basima. She wore hijab and heels. She was a rocket scientist from Sada City. And she was the military advisor to the Iraqi Prime Minister. So Dr. Basima and I saw in each other kindred spirits. Two women of similar age working with the military. And as she said, military men are very difficult. <laughs> so we understood that the different groups in Iraq were competing for power and resources. And we both believed that the only way to end the violence was through reconciliation. And that most groups could be brought into the process. Only the most extreme, the ones who wanted to collapse the nation state and create a caliphate, could not. So we helped our respective bosses, the general and the prime minister, reach agreements on the way ahead. And the Sunni awakening flourished it expanded, turning against Al-Qaeda and bringing about a huge drop in casualty figures. Now the surge was an extraordinary period. The US military changed its tactics to focus on population security, outreach to insurgents, and precise targeting of those deemed irreconcilable. The surge helped bring about a strategic shift in the calculus of the various groups. They stopped using violence. And the US military brokered ceasefires and truces between the competing groups. And we hoped that the elections in 2010 would produce a political settlement and power sharing that would set Iraq irreversibly on the path towards stability. So what went wrong? Why did it all unravel? Now the turnout for the 2010 elections was high. Iraqis wanted to believe in the political process. And they were hopeful that they could move beyond sectarianism. They were really fed up with religious parties. And Iraqia, a coalition led by Ayyad Alawi, who was a secular Shia, campaigned on a platform of no to sectarianism and Iraq for all Iraqis. And it attracted support from Iraq Sunnis, secular Shia, and Iraq's minorities. And it won the most seats in the elections. And Maliki, the incumbent prime minister, refused to accept that he had lost the elections. He demanded a recount and he used debathification to try to disqualify the candidates of the winning bloc, Iraqia, and to annul their votes. And when that failed to give him victory, he further intimidated his rivals and pressured the judiciary to rule in his favor. 
So Malachi became so focused on his own survival that he was prepared to do anything to remain in power. Now during this period, there were real differences within the US system over what to do. So General Odierno, my boss, believed that the US should uphold the rights of the winning bloc to have first go at trying to form the government. He didn't believe that Alawi would succeed with himself as prime minister, but he thought it could lead to power sharing between Alawi and Maliki, or the selection of a third person to be prime minister. However, Vice President Joe Biden, following the advice of the US ambassador at the time, decided that the US should support the incumbent, Maliki, for a second term, believing that Maliki was a friend of the US, that he would give us a follow-on security agreement to keep US troops in country, and that he was an Iraqi nationalist. And Biden thought this was the quickest way to have the government in Iraq formed ahead of the US midterm elections. But Iraqi politicians had spent the previous two years trying to remove Maliki through a vote of no confidence in the parliament. They were fearful that he was turning into a dictator. And each time they tried to remove him, the US had intervened saying, the security situation is too precarious. Don't change leadership at this time. Wait until there's a national election. But when the Iraqi people voted for change in 2010, the US once again tried to pressure the elites to accept a second Maliki premiership. But Iraqia adamantly refused. So Iran, in the meantime, sensed a real opportunity. And it stepped forward and it thought it could broker the government and increase its influence by so doing. So Iran's strategy was to keep Maliki as prime minister, but with the support of his arch rivals, the Sadrists, and with the condition that all US troops depart Iraq by the end of 2011. And that's what happened. Iran succeeded in brokering the formation of the government with Maliki as prime minister, and dependent on the Sadrists, who were the most anti-American group inside Iraq. And in the region, people spoke about how Iran had driven the US out of Iraq and how the US had handed Iraq to Iran on a silver platter. And securing his seat for a second term, Maliki accused Sunni politicians of terrorism and drove them out of the political process. He reneged on his promises to the tribal leaders who had fought against Al-Qaeda in Iraq. He arrested Sunnis en masse. He subverted the democratic institutions that were supposed to keep a check on his power. There were Sunni protests across Iraq, and these were violently crushed. And in such an environment, the Islamic State rose up out of the ashes of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, claiming that it was the defender of the Sunnis against the government. And the Sunnis, who had previously contained Al-Qaeda in Iraq, with our support, determined that the Islamic State was the lesser of two evils when compared with the Iranian-backed sectarian regime of Maliki. And when I went back to Iraq in the summer of 2014, just after ISIS had swept into Mosul, I met with a number of insurgents and these are the guys with big moustaches, not the ones with the beards. I wouldn't be here today if they'd been bearded ones, but the moustached ones. And I heard lots of stories. I heard stories of how the Iraqi army, which had greatly outnumbered ISIS and in which the US had invested billions, had fled, leaving behind all their US supplied equipment. Because Maliki had replaced leaders who he feared were too close to the US, with people loyal to him. 
and they had pocketed the funds that were supposed to be used to buy ammunition and food for the soldiers. And they're not given any orders to their troops to fight. And the insurgents I spoke to said, you know, this is a broad, Sunni rebellion. We're going to use ISIS to overthrow Maliki, and then we're going to turn against ISIS. And I told them they're completely deluded. So we should never have invaded Iraq in 2003. But nothing that happened in Iraq after 2003 was inevitable. There were hopes of a world without Saddam Hussein's and missed opportunities to create a better order. We have seen the unintended consequences of our action and of our non-action. And we remain so traumatized by what happened in Iraq that we have stood by while mass murder has taken place in Syria. A quarter of a million Syrians are now dead and over half the population displaced from their homes. So I hope my book contributes to a more informed discussion of what actually happened in Iraq so that we can learn, heal, and re-examine who we are and what we stand for. So I hope the book will help us better understand the limitations of external actors in foreign lands, but also where it is that we can have influence and what it is that we can do to make our world safer and more peaceful for everyone. So thank you very much. know that you had signed up to be a human shield in the first Gulf War. It scares me because I don't know what you would have done if you would have been there. After your first year you sensed unraveling and wrote about this as you were in a C-130 from Baghdad to Kuwait. As you had been a modern day who say the vile dialogues and idealists and the ignorance, air, arrogance, and naivety, people who believe they can bring the liberal democracy to Iraq. Can you elaborate? So that was my sense in 2004. Was anybody in Iraq at that stage? Anybody in the audience there then? It's quite extraordinary to go into another country and decide you're going to rule it without any plans, without having, I think there were half a dozen people who spoke Arabic, and, you know, just no thinking of how to do this, as if it was just a green field for our experimentation in liberal democracy. I mean, that's pretty criminal. The war itself highly contested, so that's one issue. But then to occupy a country, dismiss all their security forces, the people that we're told to lay down their weapons, and we treat them with respect, and they lay down their weapons, and we just dismiss them all. And to think that we could just do this as if the population of Iraq were just the passive recipients of our benevolence was foolish, ignorant, um, beyond belief. So that's why I wrote that, because it wasn't that people meant bad, but it was the arrogance to think you could just go in and rule somebody else's country like that, and everyone would be fine. I mean, I was put in charge of a province. What experience did I have to run a province? But others, early 20s, we're told to set up parliament, to do things like that. Never do this at home. So the grandiose scheme and the l lack of understanding of the country were just immense. All these assumptions that we'd made that Iraqis would love us being there, that Iraqis wanted what we wanted. It was just 
foolish. Well, you had exposure to Ambassador Paul Bremer and General Sanchez early on. How did they get along and were they willing to listen to views of others? Well, they didn't get along very well at all. But they were both put in difficult positions. So there was, you know, people back in Washington were trying to sort of a long screwdriver, trying to control things. Rumsfeld was supposed to be in charge of the post-war phase, but Rumsfeld didn't believe in nation building, so he was drawing the forces down as soon as the fighting ended. Then you had others who believed in nation building. So this big internal fight within the US system, should we do this or not? And others thought we should just hand it all over to Ahmed Chalabi, just put him in charge of Iraq and get the hell out. And when an opinion poll was done in Iraq, he was found to be even less popular than Saddam Hussein. So that plan fell by the way. And so Ambassador Bremer was suddenly brought in, I think he was at home, retired, painting his house, when he got a phone call and said, will you go and be the Viceroy? So like, you know, all of us, we just haphazard how we ended up there, trying to do our best in very difficult times. So Bremer never had enough staff, had a difficult relationship with the military, and constantly had people second-guessing him and undermining him in Washington. So he's been a very easy person to scapegoat. But I think unfairly, because there are a lot of other people who can share the blame for what went wrong, not just to put it on that one person. There's quite a few questions here on Ambassador Bremer. What was his leadership style like? Do you think that you can lay the blame of Iraq on Bremer's feet? Ambassador Bremer had, you know, when I first met him, I thought, wow. Because it was like working for the, you know, the American president. He was very energetic. He looked 10, 20 years younger than his age. He was able to paint a portrait of how this could work. He said, look, we did this in Japan, we did this in Germany, we can do this again. And so in these very difficult circumstances, he was actually providing leadership to those of us who went out there not knowing what the hell we were supposed to be doing. That said, he had a very small group around him, a small cabal, who were very young and very idealistic and a big believer in this. You had some of the older wizened ambassadors who were much more cynical and they were kept at arm's distance. So you had a very small inner circle and that was problematic. But, you know, from day one, the first decision that he made was dissolving the security forces and debathification. That was day one. And I don't believe he would have done that on day one if he hadn't had those instructions from Washington. Now, nobody in Washington says they knew anything about it. Now they were wrong from that. But you can go back and you can see the analysis of those who had done their PhDs on denazification. And they thought, we'll just use what we did in Germany, we'll use it in Iraq. So there's plenty of blame, plenty of blame to go around. The situation when you went back the second time in 2007, you, it really was bad, and the surge fixed it. What was the main factor that made the surge successful? Additional troops? I think the main factor was psychological. Everybody thought the country was just gone over the abyss. And every day bodies would just turn up in the streets and the rivers. It was just horrific, massive ethnic cleansing. 
And, you know, all the advice that President Bush was getting was to pull out that this place is lost, cut the losses. And so under those circumstances, I think President Bush made a very brave decision because it wasn't based on the advice he was getting. And the calculation that he took was, if the US pulled out then, this would be devastating, a certain disaster for Iraq and the region, but also, also a massive disaster for the US military, a massive failure. And so he thought that's a dead certainty if we withdraw. If we surge, maybe something else could happen. So the psychological impact to say we are not leaving, we are coming back, we're going back out. We're going back out into the towns, we're going back out into the streets, we're going back out into the markets. And now the US military's focus is going to be on to protect the population from the terrorists. Before the obsession had been hunting down the bad guys and you know, just not paying any attention really to the people. But to actually change the mindset and to say, no, we are here to protect you from these terrible things that are happening. So a real change in mindset took place. But also the timing was fortunate. Because by this stage, Al-Qaeda in Iraq had overstepped the mark. And it had really upset tribal chiefs. It had been cutting off too many fingers, too many heads, taking daughters, all of these things. It had really upset the local population. So starting in Anbar and then spreading, the local population turned against Al-Qaeda. Now, all of these are factors. But another huge factor in this was our leadership. In particular, General Petraeus. He was able to articulate a strategy that it's hard, but hard is not hopeless. And to have that strategic narrative given to everybody, to make everybody who was part of the search feel that we can do this, you know, it looked like it was lost. And to have the leadership that makes you believe this is doable, to get that narrative right was huge. So you had Petraeus at the strategic level, and at the operational level, you had General Odiana, superb operational commander, going out day in, day out to visit the troops, to boost their morale, to tell them what they did mattered. Day after day, they were going out, exhausted telling them that every little gain that they made, every little tactical success, built up into this bigger strategic success. And for the first months, our casualties were just going up and up and up. And every place that we went, there'd be another little piece of paper pushed through to the general to say, casualties. And to keep going through that, we were losing 100 soldiers a month. To keep going through that, to keep morale up, to say, look, we've just got to keep going, we've got to keep going. And then the violence broke the back of the violence by the summer of 2007. And the violence came way down. First our casualties came down, and then the Iraqi casualties came down <laughs> dramatically. So leadership had a huge, huge impact. I think when you look at the surge, it was the only time in the whole war that we had the right leadership, the right strategy, and the right resources. Did Americans really pray that much? You mentioned in the book, they prayed in the morning, they prayed in the evening, they prayed before dinner. They had about multiple <laughs> religions. I remember going into like, the big operational center, the job, and there were a couple of other nationalities there. It was like 99% American. There were a couple of other nationalities. And this Australian sent to me, he said, look, he goes, these Yanks, they pray more than the Muslims pray. <laughs> and I thought, he must be exaggerating. But sure enough, morning Boer, there were prayers. Evening Boer, there were prayers. And then on Sunday, there were lots and lots and lots more prayers. So it wasn't five times a day, but it was twice a day. 
and it wasn't exactly voluntary. You know, you said Petraeus is a right guy leading this, and he returned. He, uh, you returned in the spring of 2008 to be his advisor. Was he receptive? Was he as, as receptive and, and take you everywhere like Odierno to it? No. I never had the same relationship or rapport with Petraeus that I had with Odierno. <coughs> With Petraeus, you know, Petraeus doesn't really need somebody like me. Petraeus is hugely smart, hugely well-read, and hugely, you know, he's, he's a very broad and rounded individual. So when you look at where Petraeus was in 2003, he was reading about counterinsurgency then. He was an up on all of those things. But why he brought me back was because of this focus on reconciliation. Because that became really, really key. And I had been instrumental during the surge working with the Prime Minister's team, particularly this woman, Dr. Basima, in helping bring all the Iraqis together. And in 2008, when he asked me back, these things had started to break down. So he asked me would I come back and help work the relationships. Because Petraeus is great, brilliant mind, but he didn't have the time to go and work all the different relationships. And he would use somebody like me, there was another person, Sadio Othman, so there were a few of us who were used, he got us to go and work relationships with the Iraqis, because he knew relationships were key. But I didn't go with him everywhere, it wasn't the same relationship that I had with Odiana. When General Petraeus left after four months, and General Odierno replaced him because he, he came back as a four-star. Life wasn't always fun. Internal bickering among the staff resented the influence you had with General Odierno. And General uh, Mike Jihadi was a close friend, the interpreter. Can you explain what he did and his relationship with you? When we were there for the surge, General Odiana brought with him his team from Fort Hood. It's a very close-knit phantom corps, had all been together, trained together. They were a really, really great team that I became part of. When he came back the next time, when he replaced Petraeus, he didn't bring a team with him. So it wasn't a group that had worked together, wasn't a group that knew each other. And there's always that competition for attention from the boss. And that happens anywhere. And it's difficult for somebody like me who's an outsider, who is seen as having, you know, access. And some of the guys hated that access because they wanted to control the general. And they didn't like it if he spoke to me and then came up with a new idea, because then all the plans had to change. So you see stuff which is very human, it happens in all organizations. And you know, my experience during the surgery had been so fantastic, I was quite taken aback to suddenly these weren't nice people. Some of these were really mean, and they were mean to me. So the person I used to hang out with a lot was the interpreter, the general's interpreter because he, like me, served there year after year. So even when we had some of these terrible colonels, they were usually awful colonels. <laughs> so when the terrible colonels were there, we would kind of, you know, only another eight months before they go, <laughs> another 10 months, we knew we would outlast them all the time. And we did. I actually took stuff out of the book about the really nasty ones. Because I thought, no, I'll be bigger than them. I'll hold back. <laughs> Describe the change in relationships with the embassy and maybe postulate a little bit what would have been the re result if General Zinni had been the ambassador rather than Christopher Hill. Yeah, it had been announced that Zinni was going to be the new ambassador. 
and he'd been told he was going to be the ambassador, and at the last moment he hears in the media that it's somebody else. Individuals really do matter. And Ambassador Crocker, I think, is one of the greatest ambassadors that America's had for the last period. He's superb. Not only is he a brilliant expert on the Middle East, he also understands how to work with the military. And as I said before, military people are not always easy. But he knew which battles to pick, and he knew the value of that partnership. It's important internally, and it's also important in the eyes of the Iraqis. They must see us as seamless. Now, he left, and there must have been four or five months without any ambassador. And then we were sent an ambassador who had no regional experience, didn't want to be there, was going through a divorce, had his own personal crisis, and one of the first things he did was to get rid of, in the embassy, anybody who knew anything about Iraq. Because he just felt threatened by their knowledge. So Ambassador Robert Ford, who had stayed on to serve as his deputy, Ford, who'd, you know, Arabist, been ambassador in Algeria, went on to be ambassador in Syria, one of the best ambassadors. Hill got rid of him very early on. And he wanted to be the guy. He wanted to get rid of the military, he wanted to be the man. And so relations between the military and the civilians really deteriorated. Relations with the Iraqis went down. And the results were as I said. So these appointments really are critical. And unfortunately, that was one of the very worst appointments, with devastating consequences for the country. A different ambassador at that time would have handled the 2010 elections differently, would have given different advice to Joe Biden. And if you think of all those things, that if those things had happened, then there would have been a political agreement in Iraq after the elections. There would have been no chance of ISIS rising up. The situation in Syria today would be so different. Paris attacks might never have happened. So all of these knock-on things might never have happened. You paint a picture of Sunni and Shia living together in Baghdad, even intermarrying. Would that be possible again? Would it be now? You know, it's very hard to really understand how Iraq used to be. But one of my closest Iraqi friends, um, he was the vice chief of staff, and his grandfather had been prime minister in Iraq and had had three daughters. He married one to a Sunni, one to a Shia, and one to a Turkoman. And so General Nasir, like many Iraqis, that's who his family is. They're all mixed. That Iraq, sadly, is no more. But that Iraq, that was once what it meant to be an Iraqi. That now has gone. I mean, you still hear people intermarrying, it still happens. But the political tensions have pervaded right the way down through society to an extent that's never happened before. And we are where we are. I don't see it ever going back to the way it once was, sadly. This will be the last question to you. At a farewell party given for you and General Odierno, a poem was read by General Nasi. The ray of the sun gives us light. The ray of the moon gives us charm. But when the ray of Odierno relocates, so will the ray of Emma from the Iraqi sky. <laughs> then General Odierno told you, you had made him a better general. You responded, you changed my life. And you said one day, I'll write a story of the war. Are you satisfied with that story? 
So that's the same general Nasir, the same one I was just talking about before, who wrote that poem. I hope I have done credit to the US military in this story. I hope I've shown people as they see themselves. And some might say it's a very positive story. But I think there's a very positive story to be told. So it is the story of people in very difficult circumstances who tried their best, frequently wrong, but they tried their best. And I hope I've done credit to my Iraqi friends in showing them not as terrorists or victims, but as real people with their dreams and their hopes and their aspirations, the sort of country that they wanted to live in. So, I did my best in trying to tell the story, but I hope I've honored the memory of those who died, and I just hope we learn something from what happened. Well, Emma, I tell you, the book is fantastic. I couldn't put it down, and I'm going to get her to sign a copy of it before she leaves. And I would encourage you over here, book saying they're selling copies of their book. And if you want to have her sign it, get a pop copy of the book and bring it up here to the table and she'll sign it. But I tell you, Emily, you did the military proud. You, you, the relationship you had with them and the respect that you had, the mutual respect, that you had with the military, the military had for you, is, is really something. And I just want to thank you for writing the book and for your tough years there in Iraq. But you're, you're just a great citizen. I really appreciate that.